again, everyone, to all those who've been joining in. Cameras, everyone, please. This is, this is the final day of this year's FAIR project. It's the culmination of five years of the FAIR project. It started right here with this background right now, and I'm just getting so much of deja vu, seeing so many faces that I've been seeing over these years, plus, of course, this year's batch of changemakers from 2024. But uh, thank you, everyone, for being here. It's been absolutely a lovely journey. And to have all of you with us again as we complete these five years, it's an absolute, an absolute treat. Um, and it's going to be a brilliant day. Um, before we begin, I'm going to get Aparna, who all of you know very well, who's been wonderful conducting all of these sessions over the past few years to tell us what's in store for us today. Aparna, so what are we going to do today? Hello, everyone. And it is so good to see all of you here. And I can already see that a lot of uh, you are still joining in. So a uh, very good evening to everyone or afternoon or morning if you are in different parts of the world. But it is so great to see all of you here. Today, we've gathered here to celebrate all of our change makers, all 148 of them uh, who've been with us for the last five years uh, through the various batches of the FAIR project. And uh, today we are not only drawing the curtain on the first five year cycle of the FAIR project, but it is an even more special day because we are launching the change makers uh, guide to a fairer world, which is nothing but a culmination of all of their thoughts a combination of all of their thoughts, something that all of them have contributed to. And um, this is it. This is all about their uh, thoughts, their agreements, disagreements, their debates, their discussions, their questions for that matter, and them thinking out loud uh, throughout this process. So today is all about our change makers. It is all about the last five years of the FAIR project. And it is about, um, well, Ramit being Ramit. <laughs> no, it's just so wonderful again. Uh, thank you, Aparna. It's, you know, I, I say this all the time that uh, they're all of us who organize the FAIR project. They're all our wonderful guests. We've got Undis here. We've got Willetta here. We've got Jimena here. I see Kavita Mams here as well. Irma is here. There's so many of our guests who keep coming. And we, we of course, organize this, right? We participate in this. But the real stars are the change makers year on year, right? It's all of you. And this book that Aparna is talking about that we will be launching today and our change makers for this year are going to introduce you to some of the thoughts in it is really them allowing us the opportunity to look inside their minds, right? So someone asked me that, oh, is there a narrative? Have we been able to build out a narrative over these five years? And we said, we don't want to build out a narrative because it has to be original thought. It has to be the thoughts of all the change makers. But to all of you, I think, uh, as I said, right, um, it's this energy that all of our change makers have had over all these years. It's this wonderful, wonderful opportunity they've given us to be able to actually look inside their minds, to share their thoughts, to be absolutely open, to be willing to do the dreaded A session, if uh, for all of you know what I'm talking about, advocating for alternate viewpoints, actively going out there and saying things that they don't necessarily hold to be true and hold to be dear to them, right? And they've still done that. And they've done that, they've allowed that this opportunity, and that's exactly what we're going to be doing, right? So uh, before we get started, <laughs> before we move on, I'm going to ask some of our guests how you're feeling today. Not the change makers, but some of the other guests who've been with us who've been around uh, i'm just gonna gonna look at the first person i see i'm gonna see shivani you were actually there right from the beginning um uh, to as all those of you who've seen shivani before she actually helped conceptualize the fair project on literally our, from ground zero shivani how are you feeling now that we've completed five years uh it feels uh, quite Crazy, actually. I did not expect uh, people to be interested in the FAIR project for five years, actually. So it, it feels nice. It feels really warm. It feels very nice to see everybody here. And it's it's really wonderful that uh, that all of our change makers, all 148 of them, it's nice that, uh, that everyone is still so involved in each other's lives in every way, you know, and everyone is so in touch. Everyone is so connected together. So I think it's it's very overwhelming. It's quite it's quite a warm feeling. 
Thank you so much. Um, Undis, I see you. You joined us this year. This was your first year experiencing the FAIR project and what it's all about. Uh, how was your experience and are you looking forward to today? Uh, yes. Hi, everyone. Um, yes, it was my first time seeing what uh, the Changemakers program was. And I just have one word. Very, very inspiring to hear all of you speak uh, when I joined. So looking forward to uh, hearing more from this program and from all of you. That's what today is all about, and this it's all about all of them. So as soon as we get this done, we're going to be jumping straight ahead into hearing from them and all of their thoughts and getting them, inviting them to again allow us to enter their minds. But Irma, you were here also this year around. Uh, how how did you feel, and how are you feeling right now? Hello, everyone. Of course, it was nice to participate. It was very as the previous. Uh, lady said it was very inspiring and all the change makers were very, they, I just remember very difficult questions. They are very open-minded minded and um, want to know many things, many different aspects of the topic that we were talking about. So I'm looking forward to, the, to, to today's event and thank you again for the invitation. Fantastic. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Violetta, my dear friend, you've been here right from the beginning as well, from literally the very first session we did at the FAIR project. And it's been five years, Violetta. How are you feeling? I'm really excited, Ramit. And first of all, my really great congratulations for this incredible five years. Every year was more exciting than the other. Every year brought forward so many incredible people, young people who care, and that gives an enormous hope for the future. So it's been an honor uh, to be part of this. Uh, it was very stimulating for me as well. And I hope that this is just the first five years and many more will follow. Congratulations to everyone. Thank you so much. My dear friend, I can't forget you. You're always the most loved person to, to uh, not something that me and Aparna and the rest of us are very happy about, but you're always the most loved. So have to ask you how you're feeling right now. I don't know. I'm conflicted. Uh, I Because Violetta said five years and you said five years and that gave, gives me goosebumps every time. And, uh, and I keep thinking to myself that we must be just a little more than lucky, right? For this to have continued for, for five years, for us to be able to find 32 people who keep falling for this trap over and over again. And then the best part is they go out there and get more people uh, essentially to start applying and keep falling into this trap. I don't know. Uh, there are parts of it that, that I don't think we can attribute to anything other than the fact that uh, this is the kind of place uh, that everybody has, uh, and, and people who have been a part of this uh, have essentially said this uh, out loud, but I think everybody has needed a space like this. So if it's a trap, uh, in fact, I think uh, we've, we've managed to create one of the most beautiful traps in the world, and I hope like I never get out of it. So that's that's what I'm thinking right now. Thank you so much, my friend. Thank you so much for that. Um, before we get into the book launch, and then, of course, our change makers of this year, does anybody else want to share anything about how they're feeling right now? Some I see some of the previous change makers here, some of our guests here. Um, would you want to just unmute yourselves and share how you're feeling? Any one of you, even from this batch, if you can just tell us how you're feeling, get, get the excitement going, and then we will proceed with introducing you and moving to the book launch. Bushra, tell me how are you feeling right now? I uh, I don't know how to describe this feeling. I know I'm constantly smiling, but there's like a contradictory feeling. I have butterflies in my stomach, and I also have like volcanoes coming up. I'm really <laughs> nervous, excited, emotional. Uh, I need to find more, you know, emotions to like really comprise what I'm feeling right now. But yeah, I might just start crying. So <laughs> happy tears, happy tears. But uh, Stuthi, I want to be, I have come to the realization today when I was preparing for my little minute and a half that when I grow up, I want to be you guys. That's a good <laughs> plan to have, I think. I'm content with my dream now. All of us together, because that's and we're going to be talking about identities, everyone. That's a little sneak peek into something that we're going to be talking about during the course of this day. But good, I think I can't wait any longer. Um, we're what we're going to do is we're going to show you what the book is going to look like, and then we will proceed 
with the change makers introducing you to some of the concepts that are in it. So Aparna, with a drum roll, if we can cue the video for what the book looks like. Wow, this has just taken so much, so much effort, so much, so much time, but it's been a wonderful and lovely experience. Aparna, we have to take people through a bit of what it looks like and so that I can talk you through it before we, we introduce our chain makers for this year and let them, again, give us a peek into their minds. So this book is already, is now just right now been put up on our website as well. All of you will have access to it. Uh, in true TFP style, 281 style, we gave you a bit of a teaser as to what the book looks like. We, we kept you waiting. I hope all of you enjoyed that video and that uh, the way that we did it. Thank you so much, Shamin. Thank you, Samya. Aparna, can we have the book, please? All right. So everyone, we're not going to go into details of this, but this is what the book is all about. We can keep scrolling as we go, go along. Um, just, I want to pause right here because this has really been the essence of the FAIR project over the years where we truly believe that in a fair world, every voice is heard, every person is valued, and every dream is nurtured. And that creating a fairer world is not a task for tomorrow. It is the responsibility that we embrace today. All right? And as you go along, you will see those hopes, you will see those dreams, you will see those questions, you will hear those thoughts, hopefully, as you go along through all of this, of course, from our dear friends, Violetta and JP, who've been with us right through this entire, entire journey. We've given you a bit of a reader starting guide, which is a good page for you to look at, to understand what the book is and how we've actually structured the book. But the real value of the book, the truest value of the book is about to come right now, where for all these five years, we've been very actively jotting down the thoughts that our change makers have had, and we have presented them over here across all of these various concepts that we've got, right? And all of these bubbles that you see, and we're going through very, very quickly over all these bubbles, but all of these bubbles are change makers from 2020, 21, 22, 23, and 24, and all the things that they have said, where you will see the diversity of thought, but the unity of purpose through this book. And uh, I think there's just gonna be no better way to let you all know a bit more about this book than actually to get you to the change makers and or from this year who've taken it upon themselves to introduce these thoughts to all of you on behalf of everyone at the FAIR project all the way from 2020 till now. Thanks, Tim. Hey, good to see you, Tim. Ah, before before we begin, I need to I need to hear from you as well. You've been around for a couple of years at the Fair Project as well, talking to some of our chain makers. How are you feeling? Are you excited about what you're about to see? Uh, I'm super excited. I'm sorry, my audio is really bad. I'm I'm super excited. I'm just dealing with a minor structural emergency here, so I'm listening in and working at the same time. But uh, I'm looking forward to chat, and uh, I have a few suggestions for how we can weave all the things together. So yeah. yeah, this is very exciting. Thank you so much, my friend. Thank you so much. I also see Charmaine and Diksha have joined in. Now I can see your uh, videos. So how are you feeling right now about your thoughts being showcased to the world through this book? I just think I'm so overwhelmed year after year to see what you guys do. And it's just so grateful to see how you're just nurturing every single thought process of these young adults. So kudos to the entire team. And it's just lovely to be here, just to share a little piece of my mind as well. 
Thank you so much. I see Jimena on the chat. Sorry, I didn't see you, Jimena, but you've got your camera off, but you can unmute and tell us how you're feeling. You were with us this year as well as you've been in previous years also. How are you feeling right now? Hi, Ramed. Hi, everyone. I'm really excited and thrilled to hear everyone's process and looking forward to have a glimpse at the book. And yeah, I think we can all feel the same, the excitement, the emotion, the expansive love, and most of all, hope for all of this process. Thank you, Ramit, and everyone. Thank you so much, my friend. Thank you. Diksha, you were with us yesterday. Um, how are you feeling? You know, you, you've seen a bit of a sneak peek of what's to come. How are you feeling and are you excited? I'm very excited. Thank you so much for joining everybody. It's very good to see faces. So many people. It just feels like um, a very different kind of solidarity. And I'm very happy to hear the word hope somewhere here. So, <laughs> yeah. Thank you for having all of us. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. And Lucky, I see you as well. How are you feeling? Um, so it's been great actually since, um, but I've not been feeling well since I uh, was not a part of the project. Like I completed the project and after that it was all a standstill. So not feeling well in that aspect, but it really feels good to be back here. Um, and to be interacting with you and seeing the thoughts conceptualized in the book format. So it 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 just formalizes our thought process, whatever it was there, what whatever we did during those times at least. Um so it's it's really it, it feels good that it has been now conceptualized. We have put it in put it somewhere out to the world to know about, um, which was there within our circle itself. Now the world knows about it. So um, I, it feels great that our thoughts matter and the world recognizes it. So um, just uh, feels great to be here and to have so many thoughts around. So just a uh, surreal experience, yeah. Your thoughts always matter, my friend. That's that's the one thing. Everyone's thoughts matter. But finally, we have the introduction to this year's Change Makers. So as I said, everyone, please do unmute and share along. Okay, so now that you're introduced to this year's cohort, I'm going to start inviting them to now talk to you a bit about the thoughts that we've put into the book and their experience, their thoughts, all of these goals and themes and concepts and call them what you may, but the wonderful conversations that they've had. So to kickstart us off, I'm going to invite Nena and Manasve. So why don't the two of you get us started? All yours, both of you. Good evening, everybody. I hope I'm audible. My heartbeat is like so high. I might as well join Bushra in crying. Okay. So my journey of fair has taught me a lot. But one thing that stands out above all else is the realization that our lives, this society, this world, everything is a beautiful interconnected web of chaos. From our first session, to the compilation of this book, every conversation that we had uh, in this space, it has made me realize, and I think it's the same for everyone here, it has made all of us realize that 
everything is so connected to one another every goal every theme and each goal connects with each theme and in some cases it's like uh, you cannot achieve one theme or one goal fully without achieving the others for example if we talk about well being we cannot achieve well being without having a good environment adequate nutrition uh, meaningful education and even equal uh, opportunities for employment in other cases uh, uh one comes as a by product of achieving another for example meaningful and relevant education can help us uh, uh increase our uh, opportunities for employment so long story short nothing exists in a vacuum and everything impacts everything now manasvi will elaborate on this yeah hi am i audible um yes, you can you guys friend. see my screen yes we can yes so to sort of um continue from what naina was saying we recognize that literally everything connects to everything and this is a sh- beautiful mind map that we actually made during the fair project journey to show how that interconnectedness was looking like in our minds now this is just eight goals um and we've only added a few things but here you can see how education was connected to gender equality um and how we need to also when we were talking about education look at gender equity or how education can then increase well being or how what environment we have around us can affect education we also very interestingly in this conversation figured out that hygiene and employment are connected because the conversation of caste is very big and caste and hygiene are very interconnected we need to look at dignity we need to look at how um those social constructs are are getting involved in the policies of employment and throughout this project throughout this process we were realizing that when we're looking at the society when we're trying to figure out gaps or even understanding the society we can't do that without an intersectional lens we can't do that without a systems thinking and to maybe think of a fairer world intersectional lens is sort of our pathway to it um nena why don't you uh, tell us what we did <laughs> yeah so for today we decided that we will talk about uh, all the goals and all the themes while focusing on that intersectionality that we just mentioned so each change maker chose either a goal or a theme as per their choice and we divided ourselves into groups so that we can connect all all the themes and all the goals and today we are going to present that to you all and interestingly i mean there was a conversation where we were thinking that uh, let's all have a discussion about all the goals and themes together but we also realized that we are a chaotic batch <laughs> and that doing this would we would not be fair to all the themes and goals so we want to acknowledge that we've had an intersectional lens but for today we are going to talk about one theme and goal which in fact when we were making that decision we were figuring out which is that one goal or theme which looks the most polar apart or which looks the most unobvious that this can also have an intersectional lens so hopefully today um, all of us will get you through a journey of looking at a goal and a theme that is not really fitting in but when we were doing this process we realized that it's very intersectional it why was it not obvious to us um so i hope that you have a lot of fun because we had a lot of fun in this exploration and that you can also find different intersectionality in your own beautiful way um to the eight one project yeah <laughs> that is so exciting and and it's wonderful how all of you have actually put all of this together and all of these thoughts and deciding what you want to do and how you want to present all of this i think it's wonderful i'm just going i'm just going to shut up and i'm going to i'm going to invite the first group uh to come and talk to us about uh, the goal and the theme combination that they had chosen which was motivation and peace so shrishti lakshmi suraj shagun can we have all of you to talk to us and again give us a little bit of a peek about what you thought about these words any one of the four of you shrishti lakshmi yes, suraj let's start hi dosto myself is one sir jo log mujhe nahi jante hain uh main hindi mein bolunga like i'm most comfortable with hindi so i will continue with hindi as well so bab chila me tapko samjha denge okay let's shall we start koi timer hai ramesh ya fir main no just start just start my friend just start this is your you. space uh guys we are 
मैं और लक्ष्मी हम लोग रिप्रेजेंट कर रहे हैं पीस एंड मोटिवेशन मैं मोटिवेशन रिप्रेजेंट कर रहा हूँ लक्ष्मी पीस को डिस्कस करेंगे एम तो कहना सेल्फ मोटिवेशन पीस सेल्फ मोटिवेशन क्या चीज है और उसको पीस में हम कैसे कन्वर्ट करते हैं फिर कैसे वो चीज इंटरकनेक्ट है विद द लाइक दो थिंग्स आर इंटरकनेक्टेड सेल्फ मोटिवेशन में लाइक हम लोग काफी चीजों की बात कर रहे हैं बट हम लोग डिसीजन मेकिंग की बात कर रहे हैं कि सेल्फ मोटिवेशन एक ऐसी चीज है जिसको हम काफी लाइक कनेक्ट करते हैं अपने डिसीजन से वेन यू हैव लाइक मोटिवेशन टू लाइक मेक अ डिसीजन टू लाइक समथिंग फॉर कम्युनिटी एंड कॉन्ट्रीब्यूशन तो उन चीजों की बात कर रहे हैं तो उन चीजों में हम कैसे अपने आपको लाइक मोटिवेट करते हैं तो हम लोग uh, मेरा मानना है कि वैन आई एम टॉकिंग अबाउट टू मेक एन डिसीजन तो हम लोग उसको कैसे बात कर सकते हैं तो मैं बात करता हूँ छोटे छोटे गोल की कि हम लोग एक पर्टिकुलर लंबा गोल ना रखे छोटे छोटे गोल्स को डिवाइड करके उसमें काम करना स्टार्ट करें तो एक वो अच्छा एक पीस बिल्डिंग कॉन्सेप्ट हो सकता है ना कि हम एक बड़ा मुद्दा लेके काम करना शुरू करें तो लाइक वेन आई एम टॉकिंग अबाउट द लाइक वर्किंग फील्ड तो लाइक देर लॉट ऑफ थिंग्स जहाँ पे हम अपने काम करना शुरू कर रहे हैं मगर मेरा मानना यह है कि अगर आपको थोड़ा सा मोटिवेशन चाहिए तो आप छोटे छोटे काम होते शुरू करो कि उसमें क्या है जब आप छोटा काम शुरू करना स्टार्ट करते हैं उसमें अगर आप पहले भी होते हैं तो इतना कुछ खास इम्पैक्ट पड़ता नहीं अगर आप किसने बड़ा काम लिया है तो उसमें अगर आप फेल होते हो तो एक बड़ा इम्पैक्ट पड़ता है तो मेरा मानना यह है कि छोटे मुद्दों को लेकर काम करना शुरू करते हैं उसमें आपको धीरे धीरे अचीवमेंट मिलेगी तो वो ज्यादा इंपॉर्टेंट है और लाइक मेरा एक चीज और है सेल्फ मोटिवेशन में लाइक द लॉट ऑफ थिंग वेन वी टॉक अबाउट सेल्फ मोटिवेशन की अपनी पर्सनल हाइजीन पर्सनल रिक्वेस्ट पर्सनल स्पेस इन सब चीजों को हम बात करते हैं तो लाइक एक चीज और है सेल्फ मोटिवेशन तो एक चीज है कि एक होता है आपका अचीवमेंट एक होता है आपका प्रैक्टिस तो जब हम लोग इन दो चीज की बात करते हैं तो मेरा मानना है कि वेन यू आर टॉकिंग द पीस एंड मोटिवेशन तो हम प्रैक्टिस से ज्यादा काम करें अचीवमेंट पे ना कि अगर आप प्रैक्टिस करते हैं तो देन लिटिल बिट लाइक वो उसमें कॉन्ट्रीब्यूट होता रहता है तो आप अपने अचीवमेंट में पहुंचते हैं तो ये एक छोटा सा पॉइंट है मेरा सेल्फ मोटिवेशन को लेकर जो कि आप कॉन्ट्रीब्यूट करते हैं इन काइंड ऑफ पीस बिल्डिंग में तो बाकी पीस बिल्डर और पीस बिल्डिंग के लिए लक्ष्मी इज अ पर्सन जो आपको समझाएंगी Thank you so much, guys. Thank you so much, Lakshmi. Can we have you, please? Yeah, I'm gonna have Shagun speak before me so that I can make my point in in sequence. Go for Yay. it. I go next. <laughs> okay. Uh, so there's actually two things that I'd like to talk about. Um, in this intersectionality between peace and motivation, that's been on top of my mind since we've actually started reading and researching on this. Um, I think one is where I think um I completely realign with um. what martin luther king wrote to his fellow clergyman from birmingham jail about the civil rights movement and he mentioned how the biggest obstacle to their goal were not segregationist but in fact the white moderates wherein um they sympathized with the causes of the civil rights movement but they did not want to rock the boat which essentially meant that they advocated for negative peace which was the absence of tension the absence of direct violence but not for positive peace which was uh in the presence of justice the presence of harmony and he went on to say that the shallow understanding of people with goodwill was more frustrating than the um total misunderstanding of people with ill will and i think that really made me um truly consider that when we talk of achieving peace demanding peace requesting peace seeking peace whichever word it is that we verb we associate with it it is also important to understand what is the motivation behind seeking that peace and where does it come from and is it that we seek positive peace um or is it you know like the moderate state seek negative peace and additionally my own thought on this is that apart from just advocating for you know uh, no direct violence i think it's very really important to also advocate and understand how can we motivate people to move towards um apart from just direct violence also stopping cultural and structural violence and the second advantage point i had on this and i think i also involve some bit of triangulation in this which really made me miss the f sessions by the way um, was that i got myself to speak to someone who actually served on ground on a un peace um keeping mission and one question that i really wanted to ask them was what keeps you motivated what makes you fly from india and they went to congo and they served there on ground what kept you motivated to stand there as a third party and keep peace between two communities within congo that were factioning um and i think that is um i mean their answer was more on the lines of remuneration and apart from that rnr which is rest and recoup and how important that is that every two months they were given space to actually rest and rebuild themselves and yeah but i do think that it does bring into question how important it is to also look at what can we do to maintain the well being 
and keep our peace builders, our peacemakers, and our peace uh, keepers motivated. And I think that's the question that's been going to be on my mind. And next time I come across people who are doing that, which includes all of us as well, um, I think I'm always going to ask them what keeps them motivated. There you go, Lakshmi. <laughs> right. So since Shagun told about peacekeepers, the first thing we think about when we talk about peace, the first image that comes to our mind is conflict, right? And this is also the same thing that the Global Peace Index developed by the Institute of Economics and Peace cover. The three domains they cover are safety and security, ongoing conflict, and militarization. Now, I got interested into knowing what is the actual meaning of peace, right? And I went ahead, searched in Google, and it has a Latin etymology, and then it simply means tranquility and absence of war. Again, conforming to our image of conflict. I went ahead to Oxford Dictionary to get a bit more insight, and I got to know, and I got to know this today while I was on the meeting with Suraj and Shagat, that there are 10 different uses for peace. One, another technical use, and the use of the word peace in 10 other phrases. So that is how diversely we're using peace, but at the same time, we are being rigidly confined to the image of conflict. So in its essence, what is peace? Now, after a lot of discussion with a lot of people on board the FAIR project, I understood that, you know, peace differs from person to person. And for me, peace is equilibrium. Now, again, when I say equilibrium, we think about very facts. And that's again with it, right? Like, being an economic student, what I thought was about the concept of linear programming, where there is a problem we have to solve with a lot of conditions. And you have two solutions. What one is called an optimal solution, another is called a uh, corner solution. Now, an optimal solution means you're either maximizing or minimizing something. You're not having, what do you say, a trade off of equal amounts or anything of that sort. Now, what I want to say is, peace is not something that has to be rigid. It's supposed to be fluid, right? And it is all obviously going to have a lot of intersectionality. But if given the fact that a majority of world is confined to this definition of peace. What I want to say, the one thing I want to tell the world is that negotiation must not work for the benefit of, benefit of one party. Rather, negotiation should start working for the welfare of all. But just because I define this part doesn't mean that it's not going to have intersectionality, like I said. So I'm going to ask Swishti to explain the intersectionality of peace and motivation and the other goals to you. Uh, yeah, hello everyone. So while like trying to get into the intersectionality of peace and motivation, I think that peace and motivation are bi-directional in the sense that one spurs the other. So while I was going through Victor's the man's meaning of life, so there he taught man's social meaning, sorry. So where he says that even in like very terrible circumstances, there's this concept of inner peace. This is going to help us find a sense of purpose. And that sense of purpose helps individuals, even in those difficult circumstances, to get to those extraordinary achievements. So that is the thing that inner peace in one's head gives them a direction of action, a direction to where they can proceed towards. And the very idea, there were times in history as well, where people and the leaders wanted to have peace in the society, for which they got motivation. So this is a very bi-directional thing which is happening. One is leading of, of like the happening of the other thing. Now the, the thing is that problem that comes that I feel like with defining peace, as also Lakshmi said, it's very fluid. We never know what we really want. And one like one sort of peace that we might want want at one point of time is something that, that we might not want at the other point of time as complex as it is to define peace or even locate if there is peace or not, the very idea of having peace is there in people itself, the very abstract idea that we want to have peace. However, peace is just not merely the absence of conflict. It, I feel it's a very powerful catalyst for motivation and vice versa because it helps like, people to dream with clarity, resilience and purpose. So not just for our personal, but also for our collective goals, I think with the motivation and peace, which is basically rooted in the tranquility of mind 
and that is that sort of peace is something that we should cultivate within our hearts for a better society and for a better world thank I you i know we've exceeded our time but we have this very small thing to show and i can't go without sharing it please so, do if you can see my screen we we just wanted to make this very active and like what do you say experiential and we created a sort of venn diagram uh with names i say for peace and motivation but we need your help in filling the intersectionality so whenever you guys get time go on board search for intersectionalities search for memes you feel like is a what do you say a mixture of peace and motivation and send it across to us so we can fit it please do everybody i'll encourage all of you to do that please drop the link in the chat as well for everyone to do that to all of you but thank you for getting us started and get us getting us going i've had the opportunity to actually look at everyone else who's on the chat and it's great to see our dear friends akiyoshi anjali has just joined in as well luisa is here garans is here all of you as well uh, i think thank you so much for coming in to show the support uh, to all of these wonderful change makers and i'm sure all of you are greedy also to hear more from what they have to say so let's completely move on to the next group um, who's here that is the group for contributions and gender equality and showing us how those two words are interconnected bushra sangamitra seema and reeba over to the four of you hi hi very good evening to all i am very sorry for not switching on my camera because there was storm lashing out and incredibly unstable at work but just a very quick note on the flow of the conversation i'll briefly discuss the concept of contribution bushra will then follow with her thoughts on gender equality reeva talks of the intersectionality of the two concepts and sangamitra will try will attempt to strike a coherent tone to the whole conversation with her conclusions and activity so very briefly contribution refers to any act of giving or doing something which helps in achieving a common goal so it can be in terms of like time devoted efforts put in resource invested or ideas given now especially in the context of gender equality it is imperative that all individuals they are given the opportunity to contribute equally which would lead to fostering of an inclusive space and diversity of perspectives so essentially what gender equality in contribution fosters is the chance for everyone's potential to be recognized quickly over to bushra for the next segment Hello everyone this is Bushra Verveen and I would like to bring you to my idea of gender equality and try to draw a slight uh, intersectionality with contribution as well as identity uh, but before that I just want to say that we were born to be apples but we are forced to talk for only 6 minutes okay let's go ahead um so for me i believe that gender equality allows people for whoever they want to be um without conflicting the idea of them as a man or a woman and also without conflicting the liberties of any other individual i believe that gender is a dimension of an individual's identity and not the sole determinant of it and now coming to the next part of how contribution is associated with gender equality and i would like to take you, you to the example of the development of academy of arts history culture so one of the reasons why we see that the uh, contribution of women has been recognized or acknowledged much later probably and most pre uh, predominantly from the 19th century i believe that it's a result of gender inequality and beforehand women were not considered as the rational beings they were just solely witnessed with the idea of emotional beings and this is what we discussed yesterday as well in one of our open houses so looking in retrospect i believe we've lost a significant contribution of women into the development of science arts culture simply because they weren't allowed to develop their rational faculties through education and with talking about men i feel that the contribution of men into household has modified and it has developed which is now seen as much more significant where they they are not just the pro, uh, financial providers of the family but also equally mm -hmm. emotional supporters of the family where they have a safe space to vocalize their thoughts without bearing the pro, uh, pressure and proving of proving their masculinities every now and then so i believe when we talk about gender equality it's the choice of an individual to choose who they want to be how they want their life to look like and how they come from above the idea of the self and can add meaning to the lives of others that's it now we have reached
Hello, good evening or greetings to wherever everybody is. I would like to take my time to give a very layperson understanding of our little topic and our little theme. We've everybody, everybody here is incredibly knowledgeable and they know so much about this. So I'm thinking I'm, I had to dumb it down to like the simplest perspective of myself so I understand my topic better and explain it better. If I take gender equality aside, if I keep the term equality aside, I want to start off with gender inequality first. Where do inequalities lie? I think we had a session where um, when we were advocating for alternate viewpoints, this is something that was made evidently very clear to me that you cannot clear out, that you cannot foster equality without clearing out inequality. They have to go hand in hand. The most common example of gender equality, we people, people who we know of privileged backgrounds often hear is pay parity. Women don't get paid enough. We don't have enough money. We don't have enough opportunities. So a very simple understanding I asked around I did the whole triangulation bit a layperson understanding of it was that we don't contribute enough women don't do as much as men this is the layperson understanding now if we look at it from a very empirical perspective which we don't we never do because that's a lot of work and a lot of privilege going away from our side you understand that first of all like um, I think Bushra mentioned the reason that you haven't been able to you know uplift women first of all is through inequality they haven't ever, since the conception of time, since, you know, years immaculate, they just haven't gotten the chance to do anything. Even then, they have been incredibly evolved in the world in terms of sciences, in terms of arts. You have, the, the reason we're all here, we're doing a Zoom call, Bluetooth, that was a woman's invention. Our healthcare, Rosalind Franklin, she, she coded the DNA. It, it took years and years and years to happen, but she did it. Marie Curie, you have so many women. You have Ruth Waldo Ginsburg who changed the legislative system of an entire country. All of these separate examples exist and they exist because they really had to break the glass ceiling. They had to do so much. If you look beneath, you'll realize these small examples in your small places, in your small worlds exist everywhere. Women have been doing just as much. Men have been doing just as much. People have constantly been doing just as much to make sure their lives are better, the people around their lives are better. We just, we leave the world a better place than we find it. That's not what we're trying to do here right now. So instances of, you know, exception through women, also any gender, have always been there. It's just, you look back and you realize that they've never been in the limelight out for many reasons. That is where empiricism comes in place. You understand that, you know, the reason they aren't at such strong of a foothold is because they've always been pushed back. This is where prioritizing would also come into place. I would have loved to take in that on, but we didn't have that as one of the themes. But the conclusion of it is that it's not just contribution. It is not a transaction relationship. Equality is not based on transaction that you do so much and then you'll get so much equality. You give out enough into the world and only then will you get enough equality contribution is just synonymous to basic respect your contribution is that of being a person gender is very often excluded from the concept of contribution because equality is on a very basic level it is not that you give so much and you get so much you do as much as you can that is your contribution you have to look at things from a very holistic perspective I would like to open up the floor to Sangamitra. She has a very fun exercise too for us. And thank you so much for letting me speak for four minutes. So after having heard Bushra, Asima and Riva, uh, now there's, an, there's a short exercise that we have. And I want you all to be perfectly honest when we're doing this. So I will name two uh, professions. And then you'll have to choose the profession that you think employers a higher intellectual capacity in the chat. Right? So write the profession that you think uh, involves a higher intellectual capacity. So the first pair that we have is nurse versus investment banker. Which one of these two do you think involves a higher intellectual capacity? Right, we have the answers and the I, I see a slight tilt towards investment banker. But yeah, so the second 
pair that we have is te teacher versus a financial analyst. So which one out of these two do you think has a higher intellectual capacity? Right. So, so we have the answers. Uh, now, what I want you to do is, again, I'll be quoting two pairs, one, two pairs, and then you have to answer me uh, whichever one of those is associated with higher feminine characteristics. So the first pair is English professors versus physics professors. Which of those two do you think Physics, I'm, I'm curious. <laughs> All right. Okay. And the second pair is artist versus a realtor. Right. So considering that we have all the answers, what we can see is, you know, here people are slightly less biased, but uh, overall the tilt was towards the investment banker when we were questioning the intellectual capacity related to a profession. Uh, usually the tilt is towards financial analysts. Here it was not the case um, for whatever reasons. And when it comes to professions associated with feminine characteristics, it's mostly English professors versus physics professors and not artists versus the real dog. And why that is the case? Because professions with higher intellectual capacities are often associated with men. And professions with higher feminine characteristics are often lower paid. And I think this has a very deep-rooted bias and it relates to both contribution and gender equality. How it relates to contribution is because often uh, fields in which men, I'm not reading the chat, I'm so sorry, but often fields in which men exist are considered to be high contribution, high intellect uh, professions, whereas fields where women exist are not as well paid, are often associated with empathy and other emotions that are not considered as high value when it comes to the job market. So what I'm trying to say is that these persistent gender bias still cast men as intellectual superior to women, meaning that women are less likely to be hired or seen as capable of being hired in smart roles like those commonly associated with fields like engineering, physics. So the seemingly subtle difference in how people think about intellectual abilities of women and men translate into macro level inequalities in their professional trajectories, with women being systematically underrepresented in some of the most prestigious jobs. And I think this is where the idea of contribution and gender equality intersect. When we talk about the individual capabilities of men and women. And I think I would like to bring back the point that Jiva said that, you know, the basic respect of being able to exist in a society should not depend on, should not be driven by what you contribute to the society. Because even that system is broken. How you contribute, what you contribute, you're not really contributing in the sense where everything that you contribute is being respected. So if your personal ability lie, lies in being empathetic to the people, you won't be rewarded as much as others on the other end. Which is why it's so important to talk about the kind of contribution that goes out in the society and who gets to contribute and what is the contribution that we're talking about. So I think I would like to end with the idea of professions themselves, why they're valued so much, because professions kind of depend on the idea of contribution and that is largely driven by your gender identities and in fact identities in general. So I think we could all go back and think about why these 
ideas about identities about contribution persist because and i don't even know why i'm pointing it out but every fellowship that i've done or every internship that i've done i've often seen a woman handling these background things like you know playing the video and i have seen aparna do this right here so why is always a woman doing this you know whenever it's someone's birthday there's always a woman who cuts the cake for everyone in the office and hands it to other people when a man could have done that so why are we still following these identities and i think we are a bunch of truly really charged change makers and i think when we talking about all these things we need to look at the micro level micro aggressions that exist in and around us and then work on them so you know the change starts here the change starts now and i'm genuinely grateful for this platform and this bunch of people that we are having all these conversations thank you all right okay no thank you thank you so much for that all of you and you know such important thoughts um yes but we exactly rabit shared the screen yesterday <laughs> i did it was very true but uh, no such important thoughts that serious thoughts but then still to be able to share it with each other with a smile on our face knowing that we will do what it takes to actually move forward uh, towards a better world and a better society right i think and that's and rabit really sorry to cut you short and uh, it's not just about me sharing the screen or keeping everything ready it's solely because i do not trust anybody in the team to be able to have everything in place we get bullied I into it do we not get trust bullied anybody. into it <laughs> <laughs> all but, of the chat messages all of the links i consolidate everything because i just do not want uh, i just do not trust anybody in the team to do it <laughs> but no but thank you so much but again true to the spirit of tfp where time is never going to be limiting us <laughs> this group should stay completely true to it let's see what the other groups end up doing so next up we have uh, identity and nutrition and we've got madhvi stuti and sonia talking to us about what they understand of these words hi good evening everyone Uh, so our group is looking at the intersection of identity and nutrition, and I think right now Sangha Mitra actually laid out a good foundation for identity. So I'm just going to pick up from there, and really sort of summarize all the conversations that we've had around identity. And there were a lot of conversations. So just in quick, I think four bullet points. Ah, uh, firstly, how we define identity, right? We define identity as how we look at ourselves as being a part of the world, and how the world looks at us. now here in identity and how we choose to define it both are temporary in the sense that they are constantly evolving so some aspect of my identity might be extremely important to me today uh, but that might not be important to me 10 years later so right now let's say i consider myself to be a student right and that is a very integral part of my identity but that might not that might change um and so also taking this to another layer um is recognizing that the privilege that is associated with your identity is also temporary uh, and is bound to change so it is with this recognition we should try to find our place in the world um an important aspect of identity and peaceful coexistence is actually looking at one um accepting the dynamism of all of our identities and two um accepting the change in ourselves and accepting our identities as being constantly evolving and the last point around identity that you know i'm just going to sort of discuss today uh because we don't have a lot of time is looking at ascribed and achieved identities right so ascribed ascribed identities are identities that are given to us by birth and achieved identities are the ones that we create for ourselves and taking this forward i will like to bring about the first point um that looks at the intersection of identity and nutrition uh, which is looking at how caste based discrimination in india has happened through food right so how caste based identities interact with nutrition uh, to create a certain sort of discrimination uh, so for a very long period of time being a vegetarian uh, has been used uh, to establish uh upper caste dominance and superiority over lower castes uh and this is not very widely known uh so what happens is food that is viewed by dalits 
or other lower castes as being a source of nutrition is the same food that has been used to discriminate against them and um, has been identified or sort of labeled as being dirty food. Um, and there are actually tons of research papers talking about how this food has been labeled as ganda or dirty, right? Uh, so also we see um, how upper caste accounts of nutrition um, and balanced diets have been considered the norm uh, in the past. And any deviation from that is considered to be, you know, um, not a part of the societal order. Uh, so what we see is food and nutrition being mapped onto the principles of the caste order in such a way that cooking and eating of lower castes and communities is labeled as dirty. And I think this is just one example of how we see one aspect of our identity interact with nutrition. Another aspect to this is looking at how caste interacts with socioeconomic, different socioeconomic variables, right? And how people from lower castes are more likely to live um, in socioeconomically deprived areas because of which they might not be able to access the same nutrition that an upper caste um, individual may be able to access. So I think these are two very important points when it comes to looking at the intersection of caste identity and nutrition. And to take this forward, Madhavi will talk in depth about what nutrition really is and take it from there. Hello, everybody. A very good evening to all of you. Um, so I was, when we were, you know, brainstorming about the ideas, it was me, Sonia, uh, Stuti, and Anushka. I just got a message from Zomato. Hey, Madhvi, we are missing you. So that is my building point when I started. And for those who are not from India and don't know about Zomato, so Zomato is a platform from where you can order food. And uh, they have a huge array of everything. So it's been said in time and before and before that we are what we eat. That you are what you eat. And Napoleon Bonaparte said as well, an army march on its stomach, emphasizing how important nutrition plays a role. So when I think of nutrition, I think of the food that we consume. And I think of the macronutrients and the micronutrients that I'm getting from it. And macro is the basic, the proteins, the carbs, the fats, and micronutrients are the vitamins, the elements, essential elements, and the other essential micronutrients. So I just want to tell you four or five points and I will explain how all of them are related in due time so that everybody has the opportunity to speak. I don't want to take the whole time. Food, mood, food, my mind, food, my mental health, food, the microeconomy around me, food, employment, food, the identity as a woman, as a non-binary, and when there is a transition, uh, hormonal transition happening, and the food requirements, the nutrition requirements there. I like in the previous uh, chapters of the FAIR project, there was a guest speaker, Julia Rakhledge, and she vastly covered how, you know, small elements can make a huge difference on your mental health. And I will just give a small example. When we are thinking of a very tasty food. So for me, tasty food is chole bhature. My dopamine level is all through the roof. And dopamine is that hormone in our body, which makes us feel excited, tempted, that it's the, it's the hormone which makes us to jump and do the action. And when we start craving a certain food, which has high processed sugar in it, which is the most packaged food that we, that we consume today, the chocolates, the cakes, the packaged sauces, the packaged ketchups and whatnot, what happens is our brain gets addicted to it. And there are several studies which have showed that sugar is even more worse than smoking cigarettes because the harm it does to a body, it affects our mental health. Not only it is one of the cause of depression, it is one of the cause of acne breakouts, increased uric acids, seborrheic dermatitis is the small flaking in your head which you get. And this is just from a refined sugar product. The other part which I want to uh, convey is how we have forgotten the ethnic food of the places. There was a reason since our country is so culturally diverse, the food at every state to state 
even uh, when you move from one city to one city, one district to one district, there is such a massive change in food and the nutrition it has to offer is so endemic to area and we are forgetting all about it. And not just that aspect. The other aspect is, you know, once you understand the locally grown food there is not only benefiting us, it's benefiting the flora and fauna because that's the natural bioecome of that area. That flora fauna will give microeconomy a boom because once we decided, okay, let's make this food of the year, let's make uh, poha the food of the year, the microeconomy of that area will go booming. Microeconomy will give employment. Employment will give monetary benefits, which will give opportunity to further educate ourselves and whatnot. The other, I was going through a couple of papers where it said uh, how identity of oneself has a role to play in nutrition. So what they said is, you know, it is so difficult in these days when um, we can just order food on the on the like tip of our hands, everything is easily accessible. The processed foods are so cheap, you know, uh, and it's tasty also. I wouldn't deny the fact that they, they make it extremely tasty with all the sugars they're pumping in it, all the syrups and whatnot. They said when you're trying to, you know, come to a healthy point in life where you want to cut off the refined sugars completely, they said the addiction is similar to having a cocaine addiction. You will literally feel that you are somebody stringing off the life from you. And so one Australian research paper said how you can do it is self-identifying, that you write yourself, you know, I am a non-refined sugar eater. And there was a study done which showed those people who were, who were writing these things, they had a significant improvement and they were more able to stick with not, you know, consuming refined sugar or consuming healthy fruits or consuming diets at a time to plan and not eating at the midnight and whatnot. So it's it's in our head if we want to decide this is our self-identity. The other amazing, since Anushka could not join us on the call, I would just want to cover a few points which she had mentioned. So I will take those one uh, 0.5 minutes extra here. She said, uh, you know what, uh, in our society, which is a little patriarchal, not little, which is patri patriarchal, the women needs are often sidelined and they are just, uh, I won't say in today's time and age, but still in a lot of part of our country, they are, the main role is providing, providing. And in that, you know, case, their needs, their requirements are sidelined. Uh, iron deficiency anemia being so common in our country, which not only affects uh, teenage girls who are going into adulthood, but pregnant females, non-binaries, and uh, uh, those genders who are also in the like hormonal transition is happening to them. Their nutrition requirement is so different. And there are still, still research which is going on. Those who are in hormonal therapy, not just during transition, even females in their menopausal who require hormonal therapy or some cancer patients who are into hormonal therapy, their nutritional requirements are so different from a natural human body because they are getting something extra and they need something extra for the fuel to be, you know, going. And these are still the areas of research. So I want to just say one take home message with you all. We are what we eat, refined sugar, packaged foods. These are easily accessible. Uh, they are tasty. We get addicted to it. We are getting um, it's not good in any possible way. We have to be mentally strong enough and identify ourselves that we are not any longer, you know, consuming processed sugar, processed food, and make a little bit effort in having the local grown crops, fruits of that area, understanding it, how it's helping me, how I can, you know, consume this in my daily diet. So yeah, that's about it. Over to, um, over to Sonia. Thank you. Okay. Um, hi, everyone. Greetings. So uh, when I was thinking and researching about um, identity, it just struck to me how human beings are such curious creatures. In a sense that um, we are a fan of categorization and labeling. Even before knowing someone, getting to know someone, uh, based on the face value, based on some certain markers, we quickly want to put in put them into some brackets and um, um, get a get an idea of what uh, who they really are or what identity we can um, assign 
them too in our own heads. So when you think about the uh, some of the most common markers of identity, identity, some are ascribed where, whereas some are um, acquired or chosen. So the most basic ones that come to mind are um, caste, class, gender, race, ethnicity, the region where you uh, live. Um, all of those facets of identity, when you try to link it with nutrition, you find um, there is there's such close interlinking of it that uh, you'd be amazed to know. So when I was re uh, researching about this, um, first I thought that all those um, labels or markers of identity are the ones that influence or shape our nutrition. But um, as Margie also mentioned, and after thinking about uh, it a bit, uh, I thought that nutrition, our nutrition habits, our food practices, our food culture, shape some uh, uh, some of the aspects of our identity and our thinking and thought, everything so much. For example, uh, the food that we get to cook at our homes and how do we acquire it? How do we um, cook it? Who cooks it? And who gets to eat first? Or uh, things like that. These shape uh, our identities to a great extent. And uh, these are markers of categorization. And uh, I wanted to focus on religion and class. Uh, how are, how, uh, since... Uh, for every religion has such a vibrant food culture and uh, food practices are so deeply religiously and culturally linked. For example, uh, whether it is uh, Muslims having fasting rituals or Jewish dietary laws or um, vegetarianism that is um, practiced, uh, followed by uh, Buddhism and Hinduism, these practices are all uh, linked to their daily lives as well as um, um, as a pathway to uh, spiritual health. So these, all of these present a beautiful um, uh, map of our identity, I would say. And um, while these uh, are a marker of how, uh, what our identity is, these food practices, food cultures, as uh, Suti also mentioned, how caste-based discrimination comes into place even in uh, when it's uh, religion this these practices can be used to discriminate between religions or create a hierarchical structure wherein uh, good practices of one are uh, looked down upon and uh, some other uh, some others might be um, glorified and when it comes to class obviously it's it's a known very well established fact that uh, the population from the from a lower social class is um, nutritionally vulnerable because I think here the basic facet is that access to nutrition has a prerequisite of privilege. So, for example, people from a lower social class, if they um, struggle, if all of their thought and energies and efforts go into putting food on their plate for the next meal. Do they have the privilege to think about nutrition? Do they have the privilege to think about how they can make their bodies um, uh, healthier, stronger, and more nutritionally equipped? So here is where uh, policy frameworks from government should also be strengthened and decentralized, gone to the um, uh, taken to the most local packets and. Uh, uh, yeah, so yeah, that would be it. So, this is how uh, nutrition practice can have linkages with the religious and class facets of identity. Thank you so much, all of you. And again, so many relevant questions, so many relevant thoughts. Uh, many more of those you will you will read in the book when all of you get to it once this session is over. But uh, for now, we're going to move on to our next group. But I'm going to tell all our guests here who are not from the 2024 batch that as soon as we're done with group four, I'm going to take a short break and get all of you to react to what you've been listening and uh, tell us 
how you're feeling about uh, being here and listening to all these wonderful change makers. But for now, let's move on to group four. The group four is going to be speaking about diversity and well-being, right? And we've got Manasvi, Rose, Ariba, and Parvinder. All four of you are here. So take it forward, please. Hi, good evening, everybody. Uh, I hope I'm audible. I am audible, right? Yeah. So good evening, everybody. I'm Rose and me and Parvinda will be briefing you on what well-being and diversity mean to us. And then Manasvi and Ariba would be shedding some light on the intersectionalities. So let me tell you what well-being means to me. Well-being is usually defined as a state of being comfortable, happy and healthy in all aspects of life. But for me, it sounds more like an ideal situation which can, ra which can rarely be achieved in its fullness. Well-being can be redefined as a journey and not a fixed state. And it's okay to not have not not have everything figured out all the time. Sometimes our conversations during the fair project were simply on the most random topics. And those conversations were more like therapy sessions for me, to be very honest. I realized it was not just not just me going through that stuff, but like a lot of others were also going through the same stuff that I was going through. It's easy to always feel isolated in our struggles, but realizing that we're not alone can be incredibly liberating. It's a reminder that we're all in this together and that our well, individual well-being is linked to the well-being of those around us. It is also important to realize that it is you alone who decide how much the external factors should affect your well-being, be it physical or mental well-being. And this decision is very crucial in determining your well-being. I now invite Parvinder to brief you about what diversity means to her. Hi, uh, so I'll keep it short. Don't worry, Ramay Tisha. Let's imagine a world where every voice, every idea, and every experience is valued and celebrated. Diversity isn't just about having different people around. It's about bringing together different ideas, cultures, and experiences. So this mix is essential for our growth and uh, progress as a society. Even Maya Angelou said it's the time for parents to teach uh, the young kids early in their age that diversity uh, is beautiful and something that gives us strength. Diversity makes us strong and even more creative. If everyone thought the same way, approached the problems in the same way, and saw the world in the same way, we would never grow. So we need different perspectives to challenge our thoughts and push us to think more deeply. Interestingly, diversity also makes us better thinkers. So when we hear and consider different viewpoints, we question our assumptions and become more uh, open-minded. Even John Stuart Mill said, uh, he, knows, uh, he who knows only one side of the case knows a little of that. So by engaging with diverse perspectives, we enhance the understanding of it and even grow intellectually. So it's very important to embrace these differences to make a richer society and one that is more inclusive. So celebrating diversity is very important for our development. And by embracing diversity, we unlock the full human potential and pave way for a world where every voice contributes to the symphony of progress. Over to Manas. Thanks both of you for really nicely sort of articulating what as a group we felt about well-being and diversity. Um, so essentially, when I was talk, thinking about diversity and what even Parvinder said, that the manifestation of what diversity is and the practice of it, and what the potential of it can be, can't happen without acceptance. Accepting that diversity exists, accepting the other person is who they are. Um, and interestingly, acceptance is also the road to well-being or the first step of even trying to figure out what we want to do in our well-being journey starts off with acceptance. Um, to also sort of quote a line from the book itself, um, it says that to truly embrace the diversity in our environment, we must accept and embrace the diversity within us. So essentially, um, even well-being or we can't really try working towards diversity or even having conversations about it without also doing that inner work, without building that capacities to hold perspectives, to do the FAIR, essentially. And uh, when we are able to do that, then we can essentially see the potentials and the gain points of diversity and really as a society sort of thrive for it. Um, Another point is that our work for diversity and well-being, they need to be more contextual. Even in well-being work, a lot of the Western ideologies or a lot of Western therapy settings might not really work for the community-driven work 
that we need in M uh, we need in India. So it has to be more contextual and it has to be more community driven. And I believe that if we're able to have a diverse lens when working through well-being, then it can equip us to deal with also the internal and external conflicts um, that we're working with. And it can make diversity a strength and not a design problem for the country and society. Um, I think I'd like to have Ariba just summarize everything that we've said. Okay, so hi everyone. Uh, I'll just go ahead with with this. Okay, so for me personally, diversity is absolutely beautiful. I love how when we divide ourselves based on these different labels, we end up isolated because each one of us is extremely unique. But what makes this truly intriguing is that even when two individuals who are polar apart coming from completely different backgrounds, can always find something in common and bond over it. So like this is something absolutely beautiful. And I remember discussing diversity with Madhvi in one of the sessions. She shared a beautiful insight. She said that the well-being of the entire humanity needs diversity to exist. It's because of diversity that human civilization thrives. To survive the various changes and environmental challenges we face, it's crucial that we as we are a diverse set of people. This diversity is important for the survival of the fittest, much like the concept of natural selection. So, so basically, diversity is not just a desirable trait, but a fundamental necessity for continued evolution and the well-being of the entire humanity. And well-being doesn't mean a life without conflict or challenges. It means, it simply means having the ability to handle them. Diversity equips us with a range of perspectives, skills, both internal and external. And by mutual support and resilience, diversity becomes an essential element of our true well-being. Um, so yeah. We've explored how embracing diversity enriches our lives and enhances our collective well-being, but this is just a beginning. There are countless more interests in intersections and insights. As, as Nana mentioned earlier, the journey of understanding diversity and well-being together or any goal or theme for that matter is vast and ongoing. So, yeah. Thank you so much, all of you. And Rose, we'll always be here for conversations to hear you, for you to hear us. Uh, and Parvinder, time, as the next group is going to tell us, is looked at very differently here at the Bear Project. That's all of us associated with it, with it are well aware. But as I promised, we're halfway through. I do want to get some thoughts in from some of the guests who've been listening in right now, including the previous change makers who've been hearing this batch talk about all of these words and all of these thoughts that they have been thinking about over the last four odd years. So um, can we have anyone who'd like to share thoughts on what they've heard so far, what they've looked at so far? Um, I can see a teacher-student combination. There's Aram and Anjali here right now. So Aram, Anjali, would either of you want to share anything about what you've heard? Uh, I'm sorry, I've been a bit in and out of the conversation because of my office timings. I've just reached home. Uh, but yeah, I heard the contribution and gender aspect and I felt it was very interesting and very insightful. So yeah, great going, guys. Thank you so much, my friend. Anjali, uh, you've been hearing this folks, sharing all of them speak for a while now. Any thoughts that have been coming to your mind? Really, Ramit, you know, that all I can say is it's so heartening really to hear them discuss topics that are so pertinent to, uh, well, a sustainable, equitable, uh, like Violet said, resilient world, really. And uh, the world, unfortunately, isn't as rosy and beautiful as it is, but really taking this approach where, you know, there's space for deliberation and growth, it opens up conversations that very few are willing to have. So kudos, guys really well done so heartening and so lovely to see each of you um i mean really i can't wait to see what each of you get up to and the change that you're going to bring to this world so all the best thank you so much my friend thank you and we'll always do it with a smile on our faces however the tough however tough the conversation may be but uh, others as well please raki you've been here what have your thoughts been so far well it was just a very quick um um I think 
Honestly, the depth with which I think the um, um, fellows are deliberating um, and really trying to perhaps even step out the, of their comfort zone and the and the and the world that they know and are familiar with, and to try and see the issue from different perspectives. Um, um, I think that's that's a compliment to the program to you guys for being able to facilitate that. Um, I think in terms of diversity and well-being, uh, my only comment would be it was a little, given the state of our society right now in India, um, that discussion could have been could be a little bit more grounded. It's it's very abstract. It's a, it's a challenge. It's a real challenge that's uh, tearing apart our society at the moment. Um, so I think yeah, I'm I'm very happy. Um, that these issues are being discussed and deliberated and like everyone else can't wait to see the kind of change that our change makers are able to uh, bring about. Thank you so much my friend and this is just a sneak peek uh, the book has a lot more thoughts and we just dropped the link on on chat as well a lot more thoughts to just get conversation started right I think this is this is a start all of us need to go from here to have more conversations and take more action as we go along. Um, JP, my friend, you're here as well. Um, your reflections. All of you can read a bit about his thoughts in the book as well. But uh, my friend, you're here. Uh, Ram, it's such a pleasure. And, and hello, good uh, afternoon, evening to everyone. Uh, the first thing I have to say is congratulations to all the change makers, to you, Ramit, to the team, to the FAIR uh, project team. It has been a pleasure for UNESCO to uh, be a part of this, of this for five years and to see also this new cohort of change makers uh, concluding this cycle. I always say that, uh, and, and it, there, it was no coincidence that I joined to hear uh, group four speaking about well-being and diversity and the power of diversity. Uh, the first time I heard about this fantastic fair project was in a conversation over coffee at the UNESCO house in New Delhi, speaking with Ramit. And like we, the first thing we agreed about is that the project should be very mindful of the power of diversity. And we have seen that throughout the five years. Uh, I mean, I, I, I cannot say much, even with the little I have managed to hear, I see, I hear so much clarity in, 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 in you all. Uh, it's true, the world is uh, not at, at its best. Uh, we have um, climate change, we have polarization, we have uh, conflict in many places. There's a lot going on, but here we hear you and we hear a beacon of hope because it is in the hands of all of you who are not the future, who are the present, keep building the defenses against uh, conflict and, uh, and to build the forts that will be able to guide us through this crisis. And, and uh, at the, at, as you were saying, at the policy realm, at the community level, everywhere, every brick that you will all uh, that you have been contributing with the previous cohorts and, and those of you that will uh, come out of this, every every big brick matters to um, to uh, support each other on ensuring that the world, that our, our planet, that our societies uh, take seriously what's going on and, and, and make a, a world that would be uh, more sustainable for, for us and, and for those that will be here after us. Uh, it's very beautiful to hear, to hear those, um, those powerful words about diver diversity. And this is what we have always seen, the value of diversity. It's, I think it's even more, more, more powerful coming from a country such as India, where, where, where diversity, I mean, every day I miss my time there and, 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 and the beautifulness of its uh, of its diversity and, and and its magic. What can I say, Ramit? Thank you so much. For UNESCO, it's a privilege to be by your side, to be by the side of all of you. Uh, I have always believed that there's a reason why UNESCO uh, was a part of this from early on and why UNESCO should support this type of initiative, that it's transformative. It's a, a, a spark of leadership. And as I said, and I will always emphasize it, uh, it has really, really transformed into a beacon, beacon of hope of, of young people engaged for a future that it's better for us, for a planet that is better for us, and for those that co will come after us. Thank you, Ramit. I will have to go, but I send everyone a big hug and, and wish you the best. Thank you so much, my friend. And we have to keep at it. We have to keep at it. We have to keep engaging. All of us just need to keep having these conversations. And as I said, 
keep taking action. But thank you so much. Thank you to all of you. We're going to move on to our next group now, which is going to talk about time and employment. Two words that I'm very eager to hear how they, they're going to be linking them up. So Akriti, Prapti, Naina, over to the three of you. Hi, hi, hi again. I don't know for some reason I just can't stop smiling. Okay, so until yesterday, I had no idea what to speak today, but thankfully we had some pretty great conversations uh, yesterday, and now I know what to speak. So I'd like to start by saying that this world is not static. Life is constantly moving, and that movement is time. We have established some points of measurements in this movement to keep things structured and controlled, but we cannot control this movement. It's beyond us. Even if our clock stops, time doesn't. People go, sorry, people come and people go, but time doesn't stop. Heraclitus, I hope I pronounced his name right and that we won't comment on it later on. Heraclitus, the Greek philosopher said that Change is the only constant in life. And it becomes problematic when people don't change with the changing times. Once again, mentioning yesterday's conversation, we had a really wonderful conversation with Deeksha. And she mentioned how she has this very uh, deep and different bond with each and every member of her family and how she cherishes the time that she has with them, even her extended family. And it has made me realize how important it is to, to value time in general, to make the most of it, to cherish it, to know how to manage it well. Because as much bitter as it sounds, none of us uh, is going to be here forever. Now, as far as uh, employment and time are concerned, we also discussed yesterday how productivity and efficiency are capitalist concepts. Uh, and actually, who better to talk about employment and time than the people at 8-1? Because time is nothing for them. As Isha said, time is just a variable when it comes to work. Whether it's Sunday or Monday, whether it's 6 p.m. or 2 a.m., if you have work, you'll do it. And this meeting is like the biggest example of it because we had like, we were given a time limit of six minutes, but you know how it's going. What, uh, now, the major part of the intersectionality will be covered by Akriti and Prapti, but one point that uh, I want to uh, shed light on is that how we divide time very easily, like uh, these are our working hours, these are our living hours or whatever the second part of divide is called. But uh, Angad said yesterday, I'm sorry I mentioned the conversation a lot, but it was a really good conversation. Angad said yesterday that even if you're not in your office or uh, you know, you're not um, during the working hours, still your mind uh, can be working about it. You can be thinking about your work and like things are completely like this time of con uh, this concept of time and uh, working doesn't even exist for the housemakers right so now i'd like to stop by saying that life can be pretty great when you actually take time to live it and i know everybody is like much more experienced so these are not words of wisdom it's just something i wanted to say and again yeah Angus said yesterday that it's not about work-life balance it's just about balance so now over to you akriti and Trafi. Hello and good evening, everyone. I hope I'm audible. Uh, so uh, I think what Nena said, like, I think it's a, it's a good segue to what I'm about to talk about, which is employment and what uh, employment means to me. I think employment, according to me, is adding value and contributing to a specific field through one's intellectual or physical labor, which guarantees the person's livelihood and enables them to live their life with utmost dignity. It is a fundamental aspect of human life that goes beyond mere financial compensation. And I think it encompasses a sense of purpose, fulfillment and societal contribution. Um, and talking about time, right? With the way times have changed and in the world we live in today, some vocations are given more value than others strictly because on the based on the monetary returns these jobs offer. This disparity often skews societal perceptions of worth and success, and it leads to a hierarchy where certain professions are deemed to be more prestigious than others. 
such a view i believe limits humans but human potential and undermines the dignity of labor and perpetuates inequality by devaluing essential but lower paying jobs um but i think also because i mean it's 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 the fair project right and uh, we we've learned about so many different things like triangulation and not just believing in the perspective you hold but also advocating for alternate viewpoints and maybe finding a silver lining in a different perspective if you will and i think the silver lining i see here is that despite these challenges there's a growing recognition of the importance of diversity in the workplace and like somebody mentioned earlier that we uh, we can't seem to just cover themes without uh, uh, meandering into different goals and even though the goal i'm supposed to stick to is is uh, time here i bring in diversity and yeah so what i was saying was that today in there's a there's a recognition for the importance of diversity in the workplace and i think this awareness is creating space for people with various skill sets to pursue similar job opportunities and thus fostering an environment where different talents and perspectives are valued and i like to look at this as a silver lining where employers are becoming more inclusive allowing employment to become more meaningful and dynamic this inclusivity not only enhances innovation and creativity within organizations but also ensures that more individuals can contribute to and benefit from economic growth um and i say this because i think uh, uh, recently i read in the newspapers that four out of 10 students in this year's i am calcutta for example they have uh, uh they have taken in non engineers and uh, the, which is more than 50% of the batch it could for this year it consists of non engineers and a th- more than a third consists of women and this was a field where i mean not too many years back it was a male dominated field with uh, only a few degrees being valued in order to get enrolled into a course like this but today there is something like diversity that's been looked into and it's only because of the way times have evolved and i mean i think even going back to you know like the european renaissance and the period of enlightenment enlightenment in the eight back in the 18th century that when because of the evolution of time you realize that only looking at some things with uh, and, and like other people just said that things which are considered to be more masculine more uh, require more intellectual cap- capacity than something else maybe where you know like the arts today they're not just limited to the arts there are so many soft skills you require in in your place of work and employment in that sense i think it consists so much it consists, consists of so much diversity today because even at this project it's not just people from the social sciences right i mean we are discussing we are discussing about issues which are i mean i mean which are global issues and in order to bring in a panoptic perspective there are i i i know i know my fellow change makers they've studied there some of them are studying in the iits i mean what exactly are they doing here then if there's only one thing that's important more than others and i think ultimately employment that respects the dignity of all labor and values diverse contributions is essential for a balanced and just society and by moving towards such a paradigm we can ensure that every individual has the opportunity to find meaningful work achieve personal fulfillment and live with dignity and time i think with the way times have changed and you have to also evolve with the changing times right it's only because of how the times have evolved that employment today has so much dynamism and i think another way to look at time would also be that the time you are at work right i think that's another way to look at uh, time and employment that i think especially after covid that the lines have been blurred about uh, regarding what are your work hours vis-a-vis what what are the hours you take to uh, uh, maybe nurture your personal life because uh, now we have what's called work from home and if home is where you unwind and uh, kind of recuperate and it's also you're bringing back work to home and so then really where do you draw the line and i think uh, time it uh, i think time also it uh, means something else in the world of employment today there is no starting for starting or end point to where you um, uh, start your work work hours or where you sign off so i think uh, it's 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 opened up the scope of employment in so many ways that um, it is it has so much dynamism because of the evolution of time and how different different things have come up and value about and the values that people represent that's uh, that's taken into consideration in different ways today versus the time you spent at your spend at your job 
which uh, which is kind of unhealthy but uh, it doesn't end right i mean we see um all of you at 81 where i think this is all you do throughout the day and this is your work so i think uh, i think that's i mean one could say it's unhealthy but uh, as long as you're having fun i guess i think akriti has a lot more to say about uh, the intersectionality between time and employment so over to her Thank you so much, Pratham. That was really, uh, really insightful to listen to. Um, I would like to talk uh, more, a little bit more about employment and uh, how we look at it today. And then we'll move a little bit about towards a little bit about intersectionality between time and So the correlation between uh, of employment with money is something that can be used to determine what is the basis of the world that we're looking at today. Right? I mean, upon asking around people what employment means to them, it was clearly regarded that they viewed it as a source of income primarily, financial stability, but the realizations of how they chose to be employed also spun from their wants of passionate contribution towards the society, that did not hit. It was worth noting how when a person is somewhat respected as a human being in the society, which means that they have the basic you know, uh, basic means of societal status and financial support, they choose their means of employment rather than accept whatever they are forced into because of their circumstances of life, largely. Uh, however, Indian society is deeply rooted within the discrimination of caste and class as we know it today. And I have sort of lifted my view uh, upon this topic uh, only towards Indian society, because I think that is something that I have grown up thinking about, and uh, it is still very, very uh, large and diverse to be discussed. So, yeah. Uh, so, as we know, that Indian society, uh, like the uh, Indian society, is deeply rooted with uh, the discrimination of caste and class. And when that is coupled with employment, it usually leads people to not be able to see the meaning of employment beyond its financial benefits at all. Employment in its true form is a social contribution of individuals to achieve a self-fulfillment of their existence as well as the communities. It is nothing but a mere part of our day that we dedicate to something that turns out to be a major material driving force of our lives. It's important to know that there is a driving need to shift the mindset of employment from contributing to a mere financial factor in our lives to a greater sense of selfhood within the society. That's what I feel about employment. Uh, let's uh, talk about um, intersectionality between time and employment. So when we talk about that, I feel like it is essential to understand that time here is also a driving force as it is one of the fundamental elements of life forms in the world. Employment uh, is dictated by time in a way where we understand the essence of it. Upon talking, upon talking to numerous people after our premise on employment this year, one, surprise, one surprising yet common answer was that they got to understand the greater meaning of employment after the factor of statuses was done for the details, which means that uh, the, they were at a level where they were satisfied with however they were perceived as individuals in, within the society. And also they had the means to fare for themselves and the people that they wanted, for example, their family, or maybe some individuals were really interested in caring for animals, domestic animals that they had, or, you know, contributing as a beneficiary to us, uh, to, uh, to a society or something like that. So basically, when uh, when all of the, they got to understand the meaning of uh, employment after all of that, all of those statuses, they had achieved all of those, all of those, and they had moved to a safe and security net within their needs of employment, which means that. One example of it would be, I was, I remember I was talking to one of my friends who is working in not-for-profit ever since she started her career. And uh, during COVID-19, she saw a really huge shift 
from for profit to not not for profit, uh, which was basically people. A lot of people were shifting largely from corporate uh, corporate uh, IT sector jobs, tech sector jobs to working for you know NGOs uh, in whatever ways that they could, uh, especially for not for profit NGOs. Uh, and the reason, one reason for that would be that due when COVID hit. People took a step back and people realized what kind of world that they were living in. And we got a sense of ourselves within the world. And we realized a lot of the material aspects of our being and a lot of the driving, uh, like the soul driving force of our being. So I feel like that, uh, I feel like that uh, also, oh, sorry, I'm so sorry, I forgot to mention this, but uh, a lot of the people who actually ended up shifting, uh, she told me this uh, thing very, like, very cool, I remember very vividly, that they were ready to work with, like, 70% salary deductions as well, which was very surprising to me because they knew that the inflation was going to hurt and uh, it, 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 it was going to be just a little bit difficult for everybody, no matter what class you're coming from. For everybody to be able to adjust uh, post in, in the post COVID world, but still they were ready to they were ready to sustain themselves where uh, within a lifestyle where the where the uh, where the financial needs could be you know and like took a step down, and that's very that's that's something really uh, really important as a factor that we can actually uh, that that we can actually say ki, okay. It's not always okay. Uh, okay, time check. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, so basically, I'll just continue. So, we need to understand that time plays a key role in making us understand the meaning behind employment. It definitely does. However, if we acted mindfully more than ever today, our constant burden of employment, which takes up the largest chunk of our day, because it definitely does, uh, it would just boil down to something that we can see meaning. In. Employment should not be treated as a task that you have to drag through your day, but rather an activity that you look forward to. Thank you. Thank you so much, all of you. And that responsibility has to be everyone's uh, at the end of the day. People on this call, people outside, all of you, 10 years down the line, 20 years down the line, have to take that responsibility, right? And that's that's what all of these conversations are about, to get these conversations in early so that as you go along and you make more and more decisions right through your life, you're taking into account all of these perspectives that you you are holding and everyone else is holding as well and keep exploring and keep looking at more and more thoughts. But let's move on to the next group now. Next group, we have emotions and education and about how the intersection of those two work out. Uh, Soumya, Mukharram, Parthavi, Aditya, all for the four of you to take us through your understanding of these two words. Uh, yeah, so I'll take very little time because I have a class in like 11 minutes. But anyhow, what's going to happen is I'm going to introduce emotions and uh, Mukharram is going to introduce education as a primary topic and Soumya and Parthavi are going to talk about the intersectionality of the two. Uh, so we have like, distributed the work. So hi, my name is Aditya. No, no, the other Aditya, not not the menacing one. Um, so uh, in his classic thought experiment by William James, what is an emotion? He tried. He's a pioneer psychologist who tried to uh, sub figure out what an emotion is by subtracting completely everything bodily associated with it. So all the bodily symptoms were removed in this thought experiment to figure out what an emotion is. So for example, sadness was said to be without tears, it's suffocation of the heart, it's pang in the breast bone, a feelingless cognition that certain circumstances are deplorable and nothing more. So what he concluded at the end of this thought experiment was a purely disembodied human emotion is a non-entity. So we then come to the question, what is an emotion then? According to the current dictionary of psychology, an emotion is defined as a complex reaction pattern involving experiential, behavioral, and physiological elements by which an individual attempts to deal with a personally significant matter or impact. Now, this is admittedly quite a broad definition. It is, in fact, too broad. So then we come to what we have discussed here at, you know, at the FAIR project. What is an emotion and what have we gone through? So trying to get more specific, I would like to share a quote which uh, 
I think has stuck with me during the conversations, which was, uh, I think it was made by part three or someone else, but it did stick with me. It was quoted by someone else, but it was said by part three to me specifically. Yeah. Yeah. So a person may forget what you said, but never how you made them feel. So this holds true for all social interactions. This has been true here at FAIR as well. Every interaction we have had has had an impact on each one of us and has changed our mindset regarding certain issues forever. So the idea is that I believe quite firmly that emotions are nothing more or nothing less than just us. Our collective psyche and our individual psyche is what makes emotions emotions. Without us as individuals and without us as groups, there would be no emotion. So yeah, that is all from my side. Uh, hello everyone, I'm Mukaram and I'll be talking about uh, education. So by definition, education can be defined as passing over or receiving certain knowledge, skills or values. And by that definition, anything and everything can be education. Every life lesson, every mistake, every piece of advice we choose to hold on to, it's education in some way. Any person who has not received any, you know, some institutional education, but is uh, skilled and makes money based on that skill is also educated in a manner. The kind of education that we receive guides what, what kind of humans we become. Our experiences shape our identity and the other way around as well. So in this way, education is also becomes a paramount for all the other goals that we have been talking about here at FAIR. So identity, well-being, peace also require education, gender equality, environment, safety, they all require education. But of course, education that is based on our experiences is solely based on luck. A major part of our discussions here at FAIR have been education that is consciously and systematically provided. The systems in place work well for a larger goal, but we need to accommodate all the differences that come within. We cannot simply choose to ignore the problems that don't affect us. We need to include all that is necessary to shape the understanding of these eight goals as well. And as change makers or just as, you know, conscious human beings and like I know enough that I know, you know, being here, I know that we are co all conscious human beings. It is up to us to start these conversations and, you know, look for solutions in a more human and equitable way to make this world more fair, equitable and compassionate, more human, so to say. Uh, over to Somia, she'll be talking about the intersectionality of education and emotions. Uh, thank you for that, Mukaram. So I'll just like to share my screen. There's only one slide that we'd like to everyone to look at. So is my screen visible? Yeah. Yes, it is. So, uh, yeah, this basically encompasses all the conversations that we had about emotions and education. And what I realized while I was making this slide as well was that these were the conversations that we had in just the F session on education too. Even though we did not realize what we are, we did not put it into words that we're talking about feeling these emotions. So the first point that I'd like to begin at is that emotions are not just an add-on to the learning process. They're a central part to it. And that is something that we've tried to encompass here as well. That, you know, the positive emotions, be it joy, enthusiasm, interest, they aid us in our learning process. But the negative emotions are also equally important. So feeling stressed or anxiety can hinder our learning process, but also the uh, feeling of being skeptical about a fact that we've heard. That encourages critical thinking. Curiosity helps us engage more with the ideas that we're listening, even here. So many conversations that we had had today as well, and I'm pretty sure most of us are very interested to know what others also think about it. So in that way, emotions, now I'll literally be branching out to all the other themes and goals too. And what we have, what we have uh, as a group, what we realized was that these emotions drive our motivation and that influences our willingness to participate in the learning process and to persevere through it as well. So this is where emotional intelligence itself becomes very important because by building healthy relationships, by learning how to manage our emotions, by learning how to manage our stress or anxiety or you know anger, that is how we learn how to navigate social complexities, which also involves what is happening around the world right now. So if there is a war going on, I need to be able to socially connect to it to learn to understand the kind of impact it would have on the people there. And 
the heron comes our own personal and social identity so even the experiences that we have those are also guided by our identities and those result in a lot of emotional responses to it so even within the classroom for example discrimination with the, on the basis of class caste gender race sexuality it does exist and what then becomes important is navigating through these uh, differences and challenging them within the classroom very actively that we know there is a our cl the classes that we belong to our financial position does impact our learning process how do we move past it even uh, you know educational policies practices pedagogies they also uh, they also reinforce systemic biases by ignoring certain sections. So herein comes the importance of being seen in the curriculum. So what this reminded me of was uh, The Little Mermaid when uh, the remake was made with a black actress, with a black actor and the entire world some were supporting it, some were against it. But what it meant to little black children was that they were they felt seen that in Disney movies, which has largely been predominantly white uh, oriented, they could see themselves, they could see an actor playing their roles, who they could be in the future. And that itself meant so much to a lot of people. So here, like, uh, you know, our personal identity, that also, that can either aid or hinder, but we must learn how to navigate through our personal identity and acknowledge that identity within uh, our education. And, you know, by uh, acknowledging these factors that there are uh, our emotions, our identities, they do impact our education. What we can ensure is that we explore our own interests. We explore our own value systems. What what makes Soumya Soumya? That I'll only come to know when I learn about myself, what I'm feeling when I'm uh, studying a particular topic. What, for example, math doesn't make me feel good. So that does, that does not form a part of what Soumya is. But talking like this, talking in a space like the FAIR project does um, is a very interesting part of me because that helps me express myself. So, yeah, I'd just like to hand it over to Parthvi to just, you know, summarize and close up with our final thoughts of this. Yeah, thank you so much, Soumya, for your thoughts. Um, I hope that everybody is doing well at this point in time. So, um, I believe that any at any given point in time, we are, you know, not not feeling something and at the same time, not not learning something. It could be learning about ourselves, others, or simply the world, uh, simply the world. For example, right now, you're trying to learn about my and excuse me for talking about myself in the third person in the next sentence uh, about my that is Parthavi's thoughts or just how Parthavi speaks or converse, uh, converses. Now, the, right there, that is the learning happening. And you could also be thinking, I don't know how I feel about whatever this girl is saying, or unlike me, you might know how you feel if you're not confused about your feelings. That is the feeling happening there. Therefore, I firmly believe that for whatever I am trying to say, or for, for whatever you and I learn from the world, for it to last long enough, it has to be something that makes sense to our hearts. In my opinion, only the ability to recognize and acknowledge the emotion while we are being educated about something can help us with a better and more informed experience of education. So in an interview with uh, Morris Ellis, who was the director of Rutgers University's social and emotional learning uh, lab, he mentioned how not one single classroom can function without a good interpersonal set of uh, relationships between the kids, each other, between the teacher and you know the kids, the principal, everybody. And I believe that it also holds for the set of relationships we have held throughout the FAIR project. Um, lastly, uh, to keep it short, I believe that as educators and learners, we need to find and provide value in all that is being taught for it to make a lasting impact. But drawing upon Elias's words, I would just like all of you to reflect on the teachers that you've had uh, while growing up. Some were good to you, some were not so good to you. And I believe that we all had teachers who uh, affected us in a profound way and what we learned from them has stayed with us longer than anything else has. And that's something I would want uh, to leave you all with. Thank you.
Thank you so much, all of you. I, th I think uh, every time we speak about emotions and the fact that all of us clearly embrace our emotions and don't shy away from them is always heartwarming uh, to me every time I hear it. So thank you so much to all of you for what you said. We've got two more groups and for their emotions, if you can get everyone's cameras on, please, there's just two more groups to go. It'll be lovely for them to see your faces when, when they are talking to you. So please do get your cameras on if you can, of course, bandwidth permitting. Um, our next group is the group that is going to be speaking about progress and hygiene, right? And I'm really keen to see how they're going to be linking up both of these concepts when they speak to us. So Arpit, Ritwik, Aisha and Kushi, over to the four of you to tell us more about what you think about these two words. Hi, good evening, everybody. Um, I felt like hygiene and progress was a very unique but also a telling combination so hygiene was the goal assigned to me for like a majority of the fair project. So I was already acquainted with it. And uh, I just randomly chose this again because I thought it would be nice to link progress with it because I fundamentally believe that in the context of underdeveloped and developing countries, hygiene plays a way, way, way more important role than what we, you know, considerably privileged people think. You know, I, I still recall how I used to be on the internet when I was six or seven years old. And I had started making YouTube videos by then. And uh, if anybody could tell that I was Indian, you know, they'd, uh, you know, slap out racist remarks being like, you know, Indians are unhygienic and this on and this that. So since I was a child, I've always thought about hygiene um, from a very negative standpoint. Like why is, um, you know, my skin color indicative of my hygiene habits? And I never really thought about hygiene as anything apart from that. I mean, you're taught certain habits as a child and you just carry them forward then the COVID pandemic came and certain ones were overemphasized and then to the FAIR project. So in terms of the premise, I learned that hygiene necessarily has two aspects to it. One is, of course, the personal aspect and the other is the greater communitarian one. So I happen to summarize that on one hand, when not obsessed over, but rather healthily integrated into one's lifestyle. Not as a personality trait that you try to imbibe in yourself, like, look at me, I'm cleaner than you. But as a habit, I believe that personal hygiene becomes a key motivator and thereby a driving force for people to contribute towards the larger goal of community hygiene. And I feel like once personal hygiene and community hygiene is prioritized in a given population or culture, it has ripple effects of progress on every front or every goal that we talk about. Whether we talk about the goals that we've been acquainted with as far as the FAIR project is concerned or even other overlapping themes, but also the sustainable development goals. I feel like focusing on hygiene, it's going to play a crucial role in progress across multiple domains, whether that's health, education, economics, social development. For example, for instance, in health, Proper hygiene practices and a focus on them would inevitably reduce the spread of infectious diseases, which would lead to a more healthy population. So you'd see that terms of progress would be seen most, um, what's the right word for it, most clearly in the aspect of health. You would have better chronic disease management. So inevitably, you know, you're going to see a lot of progress on the health front. But I know that a lot of populations, lots of countries, they also are grappling with the issues of school attendance and a lack of concentration in the young population or a lack of performance or a lack of a reading level. Some kid is in eighth grade, but his or her reading level is still in the fifth or a lack of focus in the numerical ability aspect of education. So better hygiene inevitably is going to reduce the frequency of illness. It will lead to better and more improved school attendances and educational outcomes. If you're clean, that has a nice translatable effect on how you feel. You know, when you put deodorant on or a perfume on and you're like, oh my God, look at me, I'm the man today. Those sort of things really, you know, in a macro sense, impact your sense of identity and well-being. So I feel like that's just what I had to do to introduce it to you. And now Arpit can take over and introduce some of the nuances. Thank you. Thank you, Ritvik. So my aim is to talk about progress and I will be taking the, the direction of choosing to talk about progress in terms of economics. So it can be divided into two parts where we discuss progress in terms of growth, often that is called as economic growth versus development, uh, development and fairness that we often talk about in even the FAIR project. So one is, okay, if, if there's progress in the economy and everyone produces more and consumes more, which, which was also discussed in one of our sessions, 
is it necessarily or deliberately a good thing? So, so the answer comes as no, because even if that size of the pie increases, the, the point is, is that pie equally distributed or fairly distributed to everyone? So just growth in itself, growth is actually a necessary, but not a sufficient condition for development and progress. We need to look at other indicators as well. For example, my action is going to be creating a negative effect on the third party, often called as externality in economics. Uh, which means they're not even a part of transaction, but they still have to suffer. And, and we're lowering down the progress. So the point of looking at progress is an evaluative, a whole comprehensive picture where you bring in development and at the same time, sustainability. Thank you. To connect progress and hygiene, I will give it up to uh, Aisha. Thank you. Uh, hi. Uh, hello. Can everyone hear me? Yes. yes. Apologies for my camera being off because the minute I turn it on, uh, the audio keeps breaking. Uh, so I hope that's okay. Yeah. So uh, coming to hygiene and progress, in order to make progress in hygiene, uh, we need to discuss proper hygiene practices and uh, the kind of misinformation around hygiene. I think uh, Ritvik touched upon it. Uh, so one of the biggest problems with hygiene today is what looks visibly clean. So uh, the kind of misinformation that is out there equates cleanliness with appearances and this leads to impro improper practices. So ads and social media emphasize uh, shine over real hygiene, causing overuse of harsh cleaners that strip some bacteria that are actually essential, right? So this disrupts our microbiome, weakens our immune system and increases our chances of getting diseases, which really counters the very definition of hygiene, right? Uh, and so we need a balanced approach uh, in focusing on genuine cleanliness. So there needs to be public education on proper cleanliness so that people realize the dif difference between what is visible dust or dirt and actual contamination, right? Uh, another point that I would like to touch upon is uh, the term progress itself and how it works in uh, how it works for different goals and how it works when you look at it as a whole. So in certain cases, progress in one area or goal may lead to another goal being adversely affected. For instance, uh, in an article by the World Bank Group, uh, it says inadequate sanitary facilities affects girls' experience at school, causing them to miss classes during menstruation or even drop out. And uh, the article also says that handing out sanitary pads has shown significant reduction in uh, STDs and other diseases. And in the same article, they discuss how pads, uh, you know, sanitary napkins contribute to a large amount of global waste. So the use of sanitary uh, pads has helped uh, in women empowerment in a big way, right? But it does adversely affect the environment. So here we are looking at gender equality and education on one hand, and we're looking at environment on the other, and all the goals are important to us, right? Uh, so it is important to... Uh, understand that anything we consider as progress needs to be studied as a whole and uh, the detrimental side effects, if we can call it that, on a uh, uh, side effect of any action that we take needs to be addressed and rectified. So Ritvik and I, uh, the other day, had a conversation about alternatives and we discussed, you know, menstrual cups for this issue. And Ritvik mentioned how, you know, culturally some people may not choose a product like that and for so many other reasons as well, right? So this is not an easy process, but it is a necessary one uh, because we cannot have a blinkered vision of progress because progress relates to every other goal and theme, just like how hygiene relates to every other goal and theme. Uh, and next, uh, I would like to uh, call uh, a Khushi to kind of uh, add more to what I had just said and uh, you know conclude. Uh, hello, everyone. I am audible, right? Yes. Perfect. Okay, so just to continue from where uh, Aisha left off. So uh, I want to talk about uh, the correlation between progress and hygiene. So when we talk about progress, the factor, uh, we talk about various things such as better future, uh, including advance advancements in medical science, technology and living standards. So as we talk about progress in terms of living standards, hygiene is a very crucial factor in that. The correlation between progress and hygiene is evident in the significant advancements that we have made in public health and sanitation in the last few decades. 
innovative technologies and development of medical science has reduced the incidence of infectious diseases caused due to lack of hygiene. Progress in IT has enabled the dissemination of health education, raising awareness about hygiene practices and preventing the spread of these diseases. So as we correlate progress and hygiene together, there are also certain other factors that needs to be addressed. As Aisha rightly mentioned about the example of sanitary pads, we also have to understand that despite these achievements, progress has its limitations, particularly in the realm of hygiene. One of the major issues uh, is the uneven distribution of benefits. For example, while developed countries enjoy high standards of hygiene and healthcare, many developing nations still uh, struggle with an inadequate sanitation infrastructure. This disparity exacerbates the health and inequalities and leave vulnerable people at risk of disease outbreaks. Hygiene products uh, that are developed in the developed countries, even basic items like face masks or hand gloves, etc., when dumped in developing or underdeveloped regions, causes significant problems. These products, including the single-use items and proper, improperly disposed waste, can lead to outbreak of diseases due to contamination of local water sources and in environments. This influx of foreign waste burdens these countries with disposable challenges, exaggerating the public health crisis and epidemics of inf uh, infectious diseases. Rapid urbanization, which we today consider the hallmark of progress, brings its own set of hygienic challenges. While cities often better uh, often provide better access to healthcare and sanitation services, they also concentrate populations in a way that can restrain the existing infrastructure. One of the basic examples that I could share is how we as a country are adopting to the basic beverage need of the country, that is chai and coffee. Most of us consume chai and coffee every day at our homes, at offices, or during our commutes to one place to another. The adoption of single-use paper cups represented a significant advancement in the hygienic practices of our country. This innovation was particularly beneficial in public and communal settings where the risk of infections and cross-contamination was high. We consider that the traditional reusable cups were not properly clean and hardboard harmful bacteria and uh, viruses, which led to the spread of diseases through shared water sources. So by switching to single-use paper cups, this risk were minimalized. But while single-use paper cups enhance hygiene by reducing cross-contamination, their environmental impact is significant. To, uh, as we all know, the plastic lining often used uh, to make them waterproof is a uh, very hazardous to the environment. This plastic coating is typically made of polyethylene, which makes the cups very difficult to recycle. When discarded, these item, this cups contribute to plastic pollution, taking hundreds of years to decompose. Additionally, as uh, according to the study of IIT Kharagpur, a person drinking three cups of tea in a disposable cups will end up in, in ingesting 75,000 uh, tiny microparticles in their body. Furthermore, this plastic is uh, often sometimes uh, made. Okay. Uh, additionally, uh, this plastic is also made from sometimes also made from unreliable and improperly cleaned and sanitized plastic products, which causes more cross contamination. Hence, the correlation uh, between progress and hygiene is complex and very multifaceted. While progress has undoubtedly improved hygiene standards and public health outcomes, it is not without its limitation. And the benefits of progress are currently unevenly distributed, which causes a lot of environmental degradation and possesses significant challenges to the uh, health and hygiene of the people. So, yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you so much uh, for that. We're almost to the last group and I really don't want to let them start because I know that once that is done, we'll be done for this year and for this entire series of the first five years of FAIR. But we still have that group to go and perhaps after that, uh, we will get into our after party mode as we have, we've been pretty used to. So let's get the last group going in right now. Michelle, Alicia, Abdullah and Hari are going to be talking to us about what they understand with the two words, decision-making and the environment, right? So lots of wonderful conversations about this right through the entirety of the FAIR project. And I'm eager to hear what they have to say. Guys, so, uh, am I audible? Yes, you are, Hari. Yeah, I'm sorry for my, not making my video turned on because my internet is very unstable. 
Um, no worries, my friend. Yeah, uh, we've been assigned the topic environment and decision making. I'll do the introduction part. I'll be talking about the de- decentralized decisions can be used to counter climate change. Michelle will talk about the role of high level institutions in climate change, and Abdullah will be talking about individual decisions and environment. And Alicia will be summarizing our thoughts. Ah, uh, when it comes to decision making. with regard to climate change uh, it it can be seen from two perspectives one is strategic decisions uh, strategic decisions are like the laws of a country laws and ordinances passed by the government these decides the course of how a country should go go about doing things and the other thing is operational decisions operational decisions can be seen as individual choices or communal community community choices on the day to day lives and my focus is going to be on Uh, how individual and communities have been able to utilize the environment in a sustainable manner which is the only way in which we would be able to counter climate change in india there is such a vast presence of indig- indigenous knowledge with regard to sustainable development for example uh, there is cholas cholas empire and villages built and uh, built so many po- ponds and lakes which were managed by local communities and which were interconnected and which which were one of the uh main of the main sources of their income and the other example i could come up with was irulas irulas is a tribe in south india who utilize indigenous methods to um control pests and uh, pests come up with pesticide which are pure pure plant based and there's one more tribe called todas which is also a part of south indian community uh, they they are uh, very good at predicting monsoon and uh, how weather plays a role in agriculture and collectively these age old practices form unique resistance against climate change right as we know decisions can not be universally ap- applicable it is sub- it is important to identify these successful practices at the ground level which we are only doing it uh, in the recent part time maybe 4 to 5 decades ago the honors of scaling these knowledge systems which will eventually lie lie on centralized institutions like governments and other um, multinational con- corporations about which michel will elaborate elaborate on michel over to you Yes, yes. Hi, hi. I was struggling to figure out how to unmute myself and also share. Obviously, I couldn't figure that out. Um, but I will quickly get into my thing. And firstly, thank you to everybody who's been listening to us for you know uh, quite some time. And there is so many like important points being shared in like a really short amount of time. I'm sure it's a lot to take in. But um, I'll basically be talking about global sort of high level decision making. and how it is interconnected with um, climate change as a as a goal or climate mitigation as a goal not climate change um so the importance here that we thought about decision making in the fair world is it being a tenet where the decisions are made are they are being made are educated and fair and efficient um and especially in our fight against climate change right so firstly and like hari already mentioned he talked about communities and individuals but as consumers every decision we make from the energy we consume to the products we buy has a ripple effect on the environment whether we want to see it in that complexity or not but for a world to be truly free and fair everyone must be enabled and educated to be able to have a valuable voice and that is a part of decision making that comes before it that is hitting is that how are we ensuring that the decisions that are being made by individuals and by people are educated and based in um uh, lived realities but also in you know i guess fact and well researched ideas and numbers right um apart from consumers institutions and world governments play a p- p- pivotal role in this battle um their decisions on what energies to use how they use uh, means of production have huge impacts far more than um you know individual consumption um this means that in a fair world we need investments in transitioning away from fossil fuels in green technologies in ethical supply chains but all of these decisions are coming at a cost 
they're they're coming at a cost of speed at the cost of convenience at the cost of ideally less competitive markets and perhaps certain industries just cease to exist because you know we found a better alternative ideally but these are tough decisions they're not easy decisions to make so we need a world where governments and institutions and individuals are enabled to make these tough choices and it's like i said it's hard to make these decisions it's difficult to fight massive french oil corporations sucking africa dry but this is exactly why we need a world where democracy and justice and accountability are rooted in its decision making process and this is why we need decision making amongst individuals to keep our institutions and our corporations accountable and use our decision making to choose the right governments and to decide where we're putting our money um yeah that's that's it for me i will be handing it over to abdullah to kind of go into a different aspect of this and i will also resume screen share so the next meme that you see was supposed to happen while i was speaking but it's going to come now yeah uh hi everyone good evening am i audible yeah so uh, the memes that you will see right now uh, was a result of a very you know dedicated hard work that we did and uh, yeah it took 2 minutes exactly to find these memes online and we just did a google search because we did not have time because everyone was sharing something so we felt the need to share something because peer pressure is real uh even though we have in fair we have learned that there is no need to be you know in peer pressure or the social construct but either way we want to make it interesting so <laughs> so yeah thank you minister anyway uh but uh, with respect to these memes and whatever you will be you know seeing here um i want to talk about something very important that we have as in fair missed out or you know have not talked about much is the fact that environment is more than climate change guys come on environment for when uh, i got the idea you know i got the topic of uh, decision making with environment the only thing i could you know how to make this interesting is by highlighting how environment is not only about uh, when we talk about environment it's not only about you know uh, climate change solving the crisis mitigating the effects refugees etc 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 but it's also about how an individual is uh you know manages its own environment right their own environment and this is the precise this is the only point that i stress and i think uh, a lot of you will resonate how it is how our uh, immediate environment helps us decide a lot of things a lot a lot of our decisions are you know based on our uh, physical environment uh, and how we relate to it a lot of our biases are based on our environment right where we are coming from urban rural there are so many demographic uh, you know uh, points that we can take into account before uh, if if we want to analyze someone's way of making a decision right to be able to come here sit on the in front of a computer screen is a decision that i made uh, in february or january last week and it's it paid off immensely and that is the decision i made because of the environment that i was in i was happy to have been in contact with people who were part of this before and that was the environment that i had how do we decide that environment is something that uh, we can we may or may not be able to immediately or it is a very gradual change right a lot of our decisions we have to realize when we when we are around this environment when we, if we want to change that environment we have to realize where these uh, biases or where these decisions are coming from and it is important for us to understand where uh, we stand in terms of as someone rightly pointed out this important uh, once we have one side of the view is also an important side of the view right it, it's it's okay to be neutral it's like ideal to be neutral and you know no both the sides may a good judgment where and good run fair on it but uh, you know if we are not doing it it's also a good start to do it and i think now you can build up on that i rightly so uh, after aparna you know scolded us on the group i did triangulation i came with all the facts that i needed to and i did a lot of research uh, exactly for 10 minutes and uh, this is what i came with came up with uh, so basically decision making uh, can comes from bounded reality given by herbert simon he says that 
constrained it we are uh, decision making is constrained by the abilities and the information available and the information that is available to us is a classic way how economists describe i'm sorry for uh, taking so much time but hear me out guys so information that is available to us is the classic economic uh, you know problem of asymmetric information and uh, thanks to you know uh forgot give me a second guys daniel ganiman uh thanks to shagun actually thanks to shagun for giving me the expert opinion i actually uh, thought you were jumping into economics i'm so sorry no i uh, i have to skip that because there will uh, when it will go into a different tra trajectory thank you so much for nothing so yeah nothing is the another point that i will come come uh, come to next but yeah and there is heuristics and biases right where we take the we try to take the shortcut and when we were discussing decision making with aisha uh, i actually pointed pointed out that the my way of taking decisions is very you know clear the first thing i see is the most preferred thing for me and if it doesn't work out for me i will take the next one that is how i take the how i take most of my decisions in life right but it should be fancy to me if it sounds fancy to me i'll take a decision and that is the kind of environment that i've chosen right 81 was very fancy to me and i joined it uh, turns out it is not and then uh, we have anchoring where you know anchoring is basically how we have decisions and uh, we have taken decision and the decisions that will come after them are also linked to those decisions right and that is precisely how you will need to realize that whatever you are doing you need to uh, keep re re introspecting right you need to take alternative positions that like they uh, made us do and then of course there is nudge so one thing that policy makers can do to change your behavior is to nudge you right it is a good thing and a bad thing you can fall for propaganda guys be very careful when when people are trying to nudge you out so uh, nudge is something that policy makers can use for good Uh, of course, they do for bad also. Uh, and now, what they try can do is like you know enforcing nutrition. How do you enforce nutrition? You make sure that menus have uh, you know give healthier choices uh, during the during the initial pages, right? So you don't have to go to the last to find which salad you want to have or which salad you want to avoid, and just have it in the first three four pages of the menu. And this can be you know implemented, uh, enforced. It's one of the examples. now uh, of course i want to talk about environment environment is the most important point and thanks to shagun again that she gave me a very uh, good chart which i cannot explain uh, but it's almost like an individual has a lot of layers to them so environmental uh, and climate change comes at the very end of it right it actually comes in at the end of it because we need to realize environment is the first thing the first a kind of environment that we are in is around our family school parents etc and then there is media etc 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 so we need to realize that what kind of environment again i'm trying to uh, repeat this one point because i really liked it that you need to introspect which kind of environment you are in which kind of decisions you are taking and uh, then so i'll conclude with one point which uh, you know i uh, last point that i have i want to i really want to make is that in india uh, 74% of the premature deaths that happen happen because of the environmental factors either to air pollution or water pollution and this is important right and we need to start taking individual actions uh, mission can you take it to the other mean can you scroll down yeah this mean so uh, this means precisely explains that climate change is a huge ship stuck in the middle of the mediterranean but uh, that's all you can do right that but you have to do something if you don't do it it will stay there and that's how they actually were able to move that ship right they were actually able to move that ship because of this uh, small individual actions that they uh, we took and individual actions that do not harm our immediate environment are it should be the starting points for this and of course the you know you can do as much as you want but this should be the starting point and that's my gapping thank you over to alisha yeah <laughs> okay 
Are you sure you haven't missed any points, Abdullah? <laughs> <laughs> anyway, uh, I can't believe I think I'm the last speaker. Uh, but um, yes, just to not just to summarize, but to add on all the points that my team members spoke about, um, and to ground them right now in India, especially, I think the decision making in itself, especially in environmental matters, have been kind of displaced in the sense that we, like I think Michelle said that you know, uh decision making should be at the higher levels where we should direct our representatives to decide what is good for us collectively and to take the best decision. However, we see that a lot of environmental cases have are shifted to uh, <laughs> are shifted to the judiciary. And there has been I've like studied a lot of um, you know, there's a there's a history of implementing some principles that are very key to environmental matters, for example, the precautionary principle, the polluter based principle, some things that should be very inherent to our, um, you know, even policy making or to our approach towards environment in general, not just towards climate change, just environment protection. Uh, these are not implemented by or taken care by the executive or the, um, you know, legislature, but they're taking, being taken care by judiciary. So, I what I felt was that while uh, Hari talked about you know um, existing approaches, community action, and when Michelle talked about high level decisions, I think there should be a, there is something wrong at both both the levels, and there needs to be a communication between them, where people who are appointed to do certain things also they have their share of the burden. So there's one more. Uh, you know, a uh, discourse that I wanted to address was, which is very common during, um, in discussing environmental matters, especially in, in exploring the decision-making intersection of it, is whether we uh, take the expert opinion or the community engagement method, which both Michelle and Hari talked about. Uh, I think that there, when we talk about environmental matters specifically, there is always a kind of scientific uncertainty that is attached to it. And there is always a kind of fallout that is um, the that has a marginalized community at the end of it. And while there has been a trajectory or a, you know a shifting towards participatory approach uh, in decision uh, in decision making, I think what is important is of course stakeholder consideration, but also an engagement towards the receiving end and the policy making end. Uh, the people who have the expert opinions. Uh, which also taken scientific uncertainty or like as a or, you know as a factor and also the community that is being affected by either the policies or the you know the fallout of wrong environmental uh, decisions and both of them need to converse together <laughs> and not in separate rooms um so I think in the end, uh, decision making when it comes to environment, environmental matters, uh, not in abstract relating to just environment uh, and climate justice, I think it needs more of a decentralized approach. And uh, yeah, I think that's that. <laughs> I didn't prepare a proper paragraph, but those are the two points I wanted to throw light on. Okay, I see a lot of messages. <laughs> Thank you, guys. <laughs> of course, to you and Ritwik both, very, very happy birthday to you. And uh, belated to Ritwik, he didn't turn up yesterday, so we couldn't wish him then. But, well, never too late, right? But uh, thank you so much, everyone. It's, it's, I can see all the celebrations already starting on the chat because this is the last group that we had for today. This is the last time that we're... Thank you, Anjali, so much for being here right through... Uh, the entire time listening to everyone. Um, in true TFP fashion, though, the conversation doesn't end. This call is not going to end. The call is going to stay on till the time that all of you are going to be here. But uh, officially, if I may say to all of you, thank you so much for everything that you have done, for all your contributions right through, right? Um, this book that is now there, which all of you I'm hoping will see, I'm hoping all of you will share, is a testament to everything that you have said. And we've we've tried our best, right? Uh, I'm very certain that uh, we've not done the best of jobs because there could be no job that could be done that could actually be good enough 
for what all of you have actually been like throughout this journey, right? So um, hopefully there are a lot more memories to be made, a lot more conversations to be had, and a lot more action to be taken amongst all of us.